The Clean Fuels Program is a smart, forward-looking approach to climate change. It will lead to cleaner air, more choice for consumers, more local jobs, and the development of an emerging industry. This program is more than six years in the making. It's time to lift the sunset on the Clean Fuels Program and move into a brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, for the discussion. Representative Bentz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Of questions of the carrier. Questions of the carrier. Does the carrier yield? Yes. She does. Thank you. Um, if this program works, if the 10% actually happens, uh, how much carbon will be removed from uh, our, our systems? Thank you for that question. The, oh, there were 40 questions I received ahead of time, so let me find that exact statistic for you. 7.7 7 million tons of carbon will be reduced um, with the 10% reduction over 10 years. Another question? Uh, yes, additional question. And, and if, if the carrier will allow, I, I won't check in with you every time. How many questions do you have, Representative? I have four. Okay. Why don't we just do them in order and I won't keep okay. interrupting. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Um, we have the, uh, the RPS, the Betsy, the, our hydro systems, the Red Sea, the Manny, the ETO, of course our forests. What is the total amount now being spent by Oregon to reduce CO2? Could you repeat the question? Sorry, I was having trouble with my mic. We, Oregon has the renewable portfolio standard, the Bet, did have the Betsy, it has hydroelectric systems, it has the Retsy, it has the Manny, it has the ETO, it has national forests. Uh, what is the total amount now being spent by Oregon to reduce CO2? So we have, um, like you said, many programs, thank you for the question, um, we, re we have many programs to reduce CO2. So we have, um, the programs that have actually been um, given to the industries to implement, and so I don't have the numbers on what it's cost those industries, uh, like the utilities, for instance, to, to enact, but um, we do know that those programs have resulted in over $10 billion invested in Oregon, um, and especially with some of those, um, with the clean energy, a lot of that has been um, spent in rural Oregon. Um, we've also spent, we've also enacted some of the programs, again, with, um, that don't have a, a cost necessarily to the state, but are standards for energy efficiency appliances, for instance, and we know that those have saved consumers over $940 million. A follow-up, Madam Speaker. A follow-up to yes. that question. This would be a follow-up as opposed to one of my other two questions. Certainly. Follow-up to this question, did the carrier yield? Is the carrier okay with the follow-up to this yes. question? She is. I don't think I heard, it. Uh, uh, thank you. I, didn't, I don't think I heard an answer in that uh, answer. Uh, to the question which was, what is the total amount now being spent by Oregon to reduce CO2? I don't have that, I don't have a specific number for you. Thank you. Uh, how did we arrive or did the people crafting the bill, or actually the extension of the sunset, uh, uh, acknowledge the value of the 10% number? Because of course the extension of the uh, or the lifting of the sunset allows this 10% number to come into being. Where did that 10% number come from? The 10% number, let me find that. Okay, so, um, all right, so we base that number on, uh, on what was recommended by the leading science at the time that it was, um, that the time the bill was passed in order to have a moderate but impactful change on the, the carbon emissions for the state. Thank you. And final question. Um, what has been done, you know, what does this statute or proposed statute do uh, to measure leakage? That is, if we act now to increase the demand for low carbon fuel, uh, and decrease the demand for fossil fuels in Oregon, how much of that demand will, for low carbon fuels will fall into neighboring states? In other words, how much in measurable terms of the dirty energy we abate will be consumed somewhere else in the market? Thank you for that question. So um, we have states that are around us that are moving to 
a clean fuel standard as well, like California and Washington moving to do that administratively in addition to British Columbia, which already has a clean fuels program. Um, but according to a report by ICCT that came out um, in January 2015 of this year, there's enough commercially available alternative fuel to meet the low carbon fuel standards on, for the entire rest, West Coast by 2030. Um, but it won't have any impact on the, the gas um, buying or diesel buying um, practices of the other states that don't have the clean fuels policy. Thank you. To the bill. To the bill. And Madam Speaker, may I have permission to use a visual aid? Uh, Representative Bentz uh, requests uh, permission to use a visual aid. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Speaker. Uh, colleagues, you should have on your desk a miniature version of this chart. And the, um, I want to explain it first. And you, you'll have to understand that as a, as a lawyer, I am not an engineer, and I certainly didn't do well in art class. So you'll forgive the um, rudimentary nature of this exercise. Um, so the concept here is simple enough. What we have is a 10-year line on the bottom of the chart, and we have the carbon intensities called out on the left-hand column. So we have a starting point of 89. It's actually it's a point something, but I rounded it off. Um, 88 is where corn ethanol rests. Look at that modest little space. And then we, we drop down to 84, carbon intensity of sugarcane. There's quite a hop there when you go down to sugarcane. And then if we go from 84 down to 80, that is the target. <clears throat> That's actually the the, the, the reduction that this bill suggests we are going to achieve. I called out the corn ethanol to show just how little good it does because you can see that when we blend it, we only, we only pick up about a point in, in something. We pick up very little. We gotta get nine, nine points out of this. We get one. Uh, with sugarcane, you do quite a bit better. Uh, you actually pick up about four some odd points of the, of the necessary nine. Um, when you get past sugarcane, you're in trouble because there isn't anything yet that works unless it's electric. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to have an electric car, hooray for you. Now, um, many aren't. The idea over here, too, of this uh, up and down lines is to show the deficit. That is the point where uh, you are still selling this corn ethanol and you're still selling perhaps sugarcane mixed stuff. But as the amount you can include in it drops, that by amount you can include in it, I mean the carbon intensity, you've got to go find some credits from someplace. Um, where do you get those credits? Well, you get them from everybody that's below this blue line, everybody over here. And so the idea is that if you are enjoy something that's below this line, you get credits. And then these folks over here who continue to sell fuel have to come over onto this side and get them from you. You may mention, uh, recall my, I mentioned equilibrium. That's a, very, that's a very necessary thing in any market. The demand has to equal the supply or something bad happens, the price goes up or the price crashes, depending. What we can anticipate in these kinds of, shall we say, uh, man-induced uh, market situations, or maybe I should say credit-induced, that there, should, there will be something uh, flawed with the market. And of course, the DEQ understands this and uh, is trying to put different control features in that will assist in addressing this issue. Um, keep in mind that when we're dealing with credits, it's kind of a long-term thing. And one of, the, one of the problems with today's bill is that you can see that the actual impact is pushed out. You can see the blue line does not start to actually make a major decline until about four or five years out. And this means that the consequences of today's vote are delayed. Perhaps time for all of us to leave the building and get far away from it before the consequences of what we vote on today are felt. 
Perhaps, on the other hand, it's time to get be people ready to go buy an electric car. They can look out and say, gee, in five years, I'm going to have to have a different car. Better start saving. Now, the question becomes, do any of the credits go to those who buy electric cars? The answer is yes, kind of. If you have a charger in your house, you can generate your own credits, and uh, they will begin to stack up. Will enough credits stack up so that over on this side of the equation, those folks that are still selling corn ethanol to those who can't afford electric cars, do you think that, that we'll have enough credits to keep that market from going up, that cost? Well, there's the question. That is the question. Because nobody knows. And when you engage, or when we as a group engage in these kinds of um, unknowns, the consequences are almost always bad. Because being able to foresee what's going to happen is a, is a necessary thing in a market, or all those people out there that are engaging in free market activities will take advantage of us. Um, so, Representative, the, just so you know, Representative Kenimer has yielded his time. Please continue. Thank you, Representative. So the, the, the question, again, getting back to this chart, it's, it's a pretty rough depiction because it doesn't really show the consequences of the price increase. It merely shows that as time passes, and you keep your car, if, you, if your car is only capable of burning corn ethanol, you are going to have to pay more and more and more as that uh, carbon intensity drops. And if you're lucky enough to find somebody that has sugar cane, do you think for a minute that those who have it are going to drop their price? The answer is no. What happens when you have fuel is your price will trend up to whatever the credit-induced market drives. So nothing's going to be saved. And, and this is one of the really unfortunate things about this program. It doesn't save people money, it costs you money, or it doesn't work, because the whole idea is to drive you into something else. Now, when we talk about how much is it going to cost, the answer, I must say, I was very disturbed when I went on the line and looked at the rules that were put together for by the DEQ. I was disturbed because they took the cost of the program, and they tried to spread it over these years, when in point of fact, the poor person at this point gets to pay all of it. And uh, the, all of it at that point is actually 19 cents. That's what they think it's con probably going to be. That's half a billion a year. Half a billion more a year at 19 cents. Who gets that money? Who gets it? The people with the electric car and they plug, plug it in at night, they, do they get the money? Uh, yeah, they'll get a little of it. Do the natural gas companies get the money? They'll get a lot of it. That's why they're very, very supportive of this program. Will we all be better if we go get natural gas cars? Yeah, I think we will be. There'll be cleaner air, but we'll have to find the money to buy the car. Then there's the small matter of the hydrogen-driven cars, which everyone points at. We don't have them yet. And when we do have them, you'll have to go buy them. So the point here is this concept is um, flawed in the sense that we've never called out anything beyond the cents per gallon that it's going to cost. It's going to cost everybody more. If there's one message that I'm trying to make in this presentation, it's that. So what is it? What's the good that comes out of this? Why are we doing this? Why are we forcing this upon everybody in Oregon? And that's why I asked the question, has, has someone gone around and added up everything we've already done? Has someone taken all the efforts this little state has engaged in to make itself cleaner and seen how this stacks on top of that? Anybody done that? The answer is no. And so the incredible amount of hard work and Oregon dollars that have gone into making Oregon cleaner have been ignored. No, this is just, let's do this now. Let's stack it on top. And we don't even know what we're stacking on top of. It's really kind of sad because this is a serious matter. We heard that in the discussion earlier. This is a serious matter. So what exactly happens? I, I went and I, I tried to put together the numbers. If, if this program works, and you have to go through, I have to go this kind of slowly, there's a 10% reduction in carbon. We have about a third of our carbon footprint in Oregon is by cars. That means that um, uh, there, we, we generate all of 36 million metric tons a year here in Oregon of carbon. One third of that is 12 million metric tons. 10% is 1.2 million metric tons. So if this were to work, we would save 1.2 million metric tons. Big number, huh? But it 
shrinks when we look at it in light of, let's say, China, who this year, actually last year, created 10 billion, 330 million tons. Or how about the USA, which last year created 5 billion, 300 million metric tons. But this program will save 1.2 million. At what cost? Well, we already figured that out. At the end of the program, when we are not yet saving 10%, at what cost is going to cost Oregonians half a billion, half a billion dollars to save 1.2 million metric tons. It's really kind of sad. It actually, it's kind of beyond that. So what is the problem with this device other than it's incredibly complex? And I kind of apologize for the, all the lines and stuff going around, but the idea here is to try to get across how complicated this system is. If in Europe, when they tried this, they gave up, they quit. They moved away from the cap and trade, which this is, and they moved to a carbon tax. Why? Because a carbon tax is open, and they could show everybody what they were doing. This is what we call a stealth tax. Actually, I stole the word. They called it a stealth tax. Why? Because it, it doesn't really look like a tax. The Representative, one moment, please. Yes. Um, Representative Barreto yields his time. Thank you. Please continue. The, the, it doesn't really look like a tax, it looks more like just the government telling you to do something and then you have to pay more. Wait, that is kind of like a tax. So the point is, the government doesn't get the money. Who gets the money? Who gets the money? The money goes to folks that generate credits. Who would that be? It's anybody that sells fuel that's below this blue line. Representative, one moment. Uh, Representative Barnhart, for what purpose are you in the queue? Uh, Madam Speaker, I raised to make a parliamentary inquiry. Please state your inquiry. Uh, is Senate Bill uh, 324A a bill for raising revenue requiring a three-fifths vote for passage? We're talking about taxes here. Thank you, Representative. I do have an opinion from Legislative Council stating that um, this bill does not say providing revenue raising that requires approval by a three-fifths majority. This is not a bill for raising revenue, um, so that is the answer to your question. May I can, can I continue, Madam Speaker? Uh, Representative Benz, continue. Thank you so much for that. And I'm tempted to say if it walks like a duck, but I suddenly realized the one that just raised the point of issue might take umbrage at the fact that I would raise the issue of a duck. So moving on. Um, so what is the, what, is, what are we trying to do here today? To me, the question is, let's look at the goal of, the, of all of us. The goal is to, in some fashion, effectively make the world and Oregon a safer place for our kids. That's our goal, isn't it? At the end of the day, our goal is not to cost our farmers and our ranchers and everybody else money that they don't have or the people in downtown Portland that don't get around on a pogo stick or a skateboard, the people that actually have to drive to work, the people in Salem or in Eugene, the folks that need to have a car and can't afford it with something that runs on something other than gas with corn ethanol in it. The idea is to help these folks. And the idea is to get it right. This does not get it right. This is an expensive thing. It's going to cost everybody money. The goal is not achieved at all well with this. We can do much better. I urge a no vote. Thank you, Representative. Colleagues, um, just a heads up, um, we're at 1230. I suspect we will continue to work through the lunch hour um, in anticipation of that. We do have um, the lunch prepared in the lounge in my office. Through this door here, there are beverages and food, so if you need uh, to eat something and return to the floor, um, there is food available in my office. Further discussion? Representative Parrish. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question to the carrier, or actually a couple questions to the carrier, so maybe dispense with that. Well, we'll see. Question of the carrier. Does carrier? Yes. Thank you. Um, and I hope our staff got these to you in time. So um, uh, the first question I have is, what impact has the 10% ethanol requirement had on food prices? And that could be in our state or you know, throughout the United States. 
Um, so there's a national requirement that we mix 10% ethanol into the gasolines. In 2014, the Congressional Budget Office released an, else, uh, an analysis that looked at that question and what the impact was at food, and it said um, that beyond 2014, it will have no significant impacts on, fuel, on food. Um, in addition, um, if there were an increase in rates, like there's a talk of doing an increased rate, it would only have um, one quarter of one percent increase potentially if we went to that higher limit. There has been a report by the World Bank in 2019, uh, or sorry, not yet, 2013, that said that um, the biggest impact on food prices are the uh, crude oil prices. Thank you. Um, follow-up question? Follow-up? Does Carrie yield? Follow-up. Yes, she does. Uh, given the research that scaling ethanol production will rely heavily on an unprecedented need to use GMO crops to meet the demand, which could cause an increased consumption of farmland used to produce GMO products for ethanol, what impact do you envision both at the state and national level on GMO, uh, non-GMO food production and both the costs and the ability of the consumer to access foods that have not been produced with genetically modified organisms? So the way that uh, crops are produced in Oregon is set by the federal government, uh, the state legislature, and the Department of Agriculture. The Clean Fuels Program won't have any impact on the laws and the rules that are dictating agricultural practices in our state. Thank you. Follow-up? Follow-up. Does Carrie yield? Yes. She does. Oregon suffers from the eighth highest unemployment rate in the nation at 6.7 percent. Nearly 17 percent of Oregonians live in poverty. Studies on California's low carbon fuel standards suggest that the positive uh, impact uh, made by this technology on jobs will be outweighed by a loss of 30 to 50,000 jobs in California. What guarantees do we have that an increased fuel and transportation costs won't have the same damaging effect on Oregon's economy? Yeah, thank you for giving me that question. Um, so first of all, I would just like to point out that the figure that that um, is, the study that the figure is taken from has been widely refuted. It was um, a Western States Petroleum Association funded study in California, and that study has been discredited by, by a peer review process. Um, however, I would um, just point out, so the job loss, um, I don't know that I would go with that, um, that figure, but also the, the situation in California and Oregon are two completely different things. For, one of the biggest things is that Oregon doesn't have any oil refineries in our state except for bio refineries. Um, and um, so when you model, when you do different modelings of how it will impact Oregonians, we won't have the loss of jobs that you have in California because we don't have any of those um, oil refineries. Jack Fawcett's and Associates modeled eight different scenarios in Oregon and none of them showed any job loss because of that fact. Thank you. One last follow-up. Yes. One last question. Is the carrier yield? She yes. Does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lastly, given the real concern that the implementation of low-carbon fuel standards uh, will drive consumer prices, do you think the result of this bill will make it easier or more difficult for low-income and middle-class families to move out of poverty and work towards increased upward mobility? So one of the things that this job does is in sense uh, the growth of a, of a clean fuels economy here in Oregon. I mean, it, we, are, we are having a mechanism that supports that, which would grow jobs and grow um, industries. Um, so, and, and the impact on prices um, in 10 years when this program has um, been, um, will be implemented is shown to be very small. In addition, all, currently all of the alternative fuels that we're using are are priced lower than the price of diesel and gas right now. So the impacts on low-income Oregonians um, should be negligible, and this will help create more jobs in Oregon. Thank you. Madam Speaker, to the bill. To the bill. Colleagues, I want to thank the carrier of the bill for taking the time to answer my questions. I think that is a really important part of our process. Before I ran for office as a citizen, nothing made me angrier than when you'd meet a politician and they would pat voters on the head and tell them what you, they think you wanted to hear instead of just telling it like it is. It was with that in mind that when I ran for office in 2010, I made very few promises to my constituents and ones that I made a priority to keep. I would have an open door policy and I've never turned down a single meeting with anyone who's asked to meet with me, even when I knew the conversation was not gonna be easy. And colleagues, today we, we know that this conversation on SB 324 is not an easy one, so I appreciate the debate. Uh, people would always get to know where I stand, even if we weren't going to agree. And I think disagreement, uh, like we're hearing today, is a healthy part of our democracy. Um, I would always consider better data in order to make an informed decision, and we're certainly hearing a lot of data thrown around. 
And as a freshman, you know, I worked on bills to pass hard things like kicker reform. Uh, and as a sophomore, I voted myself out of her. So we have difficult conversations on this floor every day. My community supported me on that, and I'm extremely grateful and humbled. But the other commitment I made to commun my community, uh, that the passage of SB 324 will make it much harder to keep uh, I made one other, excuse me, I made one other commitment to my community, and the passage of this bill will make it harder for us to keep that, me to keep that commitment. I keep a chart in my office, it's on your floor desk today, uh, and we update it from time to time to keep it current. It starts with the month I declared I would run for office, July of 2010, and the most recent month reflected is January 2015. The chart denotes the statewide number for SNAP recipients by month. 54 months of data and colleagues with the passage of SB 324, the odds do not seem to be in our favor in terms of reducing uh, these numbers. In July 2010, we had almost 1,718,000 Oregonians on food stamps. In discussion after discussion at my neighbor's door, I made a commitment that I would not stop until we moved that dial in favor of lifting low-income Oregonians out of poverty. As a member of the minority party, I have been disheartened to see the dial move, but in the wrong direction. At peak participation under Kitzhopper's governorship, we saw that number swell to nearly 810,000 Oregonians. In January 2015, that number, while reduced, sits uncomfortably at over 775,000 Oregonians. That's nearly 60,000 more people since July 2010 across all of our districts who rely on a government program and what precious little cash they have to feed and take care of their families. In my first question to the carrier, I asked the carrier of the bill about the impact that ethanol production has had on food prices. Last Friday, a bipartisan bill was introduced in Congress by Senator Pat Toomey, the Republican from Pennsylvania, and Senator Dianne Feinstein, a Democratic senator from California, another state that is trying to navigate this low-carbon fuel standard path. Now, it's easy to say that Senator Feinstein is not of my same political persuasion, but I absolutely agree with her statement about why she sponsored the bill. She said, a significant amount of U.S. corn is currently used for fuel. If that mandate continues to expand towards the full implementation, the price of corn will increase. According to the Congressional Budget Office, that would mean as much as $3.5 billion each year in increased food costs. Americans living on the margin simply can't afford that. She further stated, our infrastructure has a ceiling for the amount of corn ethanol that can be used, and we're rapidly approaching it. Companies are physically unable to blend more corn ethanol into gasoline without causing problems for many gas stations and older automobiles. So I want to focus on Feinstein's comments about people living on the margins and their inability to absorb increased food costs created as a result of pushing alternative agriculture-based fuels. Many of you follow along on my Facebook page, and I regularly post about the adventures at the grocery store and in my kitchen. Many of you also know that I used to own a company that focused solely on helping families save money at the grocery store. I also used to run a blog called The Shopping Cart Economist, and I tracked food prices at the macroeconomic market level. The implications for food prices caused by the passage of SB 324 would make an excellent blog post about what has already happened to food prices uh, based on the corn ethanol standard and what will happen when states like or Oregon implement risky, unproven legislation like SB 324. I'll give you an example. It's March, and St. Patrick's Day and Easter are right around the corner. Some common holiday staples that Oregon shoppers will put in their cart, corned beef, butter, and eggs. Just a few short years ago, the price of a pound of corned beef could be had for about $1.59 a pound. This year, Oregon shoppers will be lucky if they can find it for under $4 a pound. Representative, one moment. Representative Nierman uh, um, cedes his time to you. Thank Please continue. You. This year, um, Oregon uh, shoppers will be lucky if they can find it for under $4 a pound. Butter would run three pounds for $5. Has anyone bought butter recently? It's now almost $5 per pound. It takes a shabby shopper some effort to find a pound on sale for $2.99. And eggs, those have gone up as well. What hasn't gone up is the income of Oregonians, and the SNAP program isn't tracking appropriately for inflation, let alone runaway growth in food costs. How does that relate to SB 324? When I was working on my MBA, I got into a debate with a professor. I had posted on a blog post in December 2007 that said, food prices in 2008 were going to dramatically rise. I told my professor that I thought we were in a recession. 
He gave me the technical definition of a recession and replied that, um, that while two consecutive, and I replied back, that while two consecutive quarters of a down GDP indeed might make a recession, a New York roast that had not reached seasonal pricing benchmarks might also mean a recession. That's because nearly every industry which will be affected by bills like this in, in, in states with no expertise, uh, every industry in America intersects with your local grocery store. If the cost of agricultural inputs like feed, seed, and fertilizer increase, then so too will the value added products that your constituents buy. Many of those inputs heavily rely on affordable fuels, not just for their production, but for transportation costs along the production line from raw products to finished goods on a store sell shelf where our constituents shop. The diminished buying capacity of consumers in our community means that when food prices go up due to transportation and agriculture costs, the consumer is forced to make real decisions about what type of food choices they can afford to make. For middle class families, it might mean cutting back on organic fruit on, or non-GMO food purchases. But while they still have enough to feed their families, it will impact their ability to spend disposable income in other sectors of the economy. For impoverished families, it means the choice of skipping a meal or buying very cheap foods with minimal nutritional value. It could also mean the difference of buying food or choosing to pay their rent or keep their heat on. But it's not just the delivery of transportation and agriculture costs reflected in store prices. Every industry touches your community store, so anything government allows to artificially drive fuel prices will have a chilling effect for families. Many organic foods, non-GMO, or fair trade products, particularly those that are imported, will be out of the reach of families trying to make informed grocery purchases. Senator Feinstein's Republican counterpart, Senator Toomey, was also correct in his assertion on their, on their shared bill. The renewable fuel standard requires fuel suppliers to blend millions of bio, gallons of bio, biofuels, most often corn ethanol, into the nation's gasoline supplies. It drives up gas prices, increases food costs, damage cars, engines, and is harmful to the environment. Remember, this is a bipartisan piece of legislation sponsored by two very ideologically diverse U.S. Senators who have both come to the same conclusion that unproven fuel standards and their imp uh, will have impacts on families across the nation. Colleagues, I have tracked food prices for more than a decade. When a natural disaster like the tsunami that wiped out rice crops and caused a worldwide shortage in the marketplace a few years back, it devastated families around the globe. U.S. restaurant owners who specialized in Asian cuisine reported a loss of income for that short period the market was interrupted. Now, that was a natural disaster. It was short, episodic, and the market recovered. When we interrupted the market by rushing corn ethanol production without understanding the consequences, we disrupted the grocery store marketplace for the past decade. The box of cereal that sells for $3.99 used to be 20 ounces. It's now nine ounces for the same price. And that 20 ounce box is now nearly $6. The bottom line is, and what our congressional counterparts are coming to realize, is something extremely critical for the people we represent, particularly those at the bottom end of the income scale. Our food supply and our fuel supply cannot compete. Food and fuel in a symbiotic relationship is a win for grocery consumers. It keeps prices low and makes it more easy for consumers to make new food choices like organic, non-GMO, or fair trade. It does not work when food and fuel are pitted against each other in a competitive way, and we've seen the results like the ones I've described at your local store. We can expect the negative relationship to increase with the passage of SB 324, and the real losers are our lower income constituents who now have less buying power and less control over their health when they cheap foods are the only food choices they can make. My second question to the carrier was about genetically modified organisms as it relates to fuel production to reach those low carbon fuel standards. Representative, and, yes. one moment. Representative Olson yields his time. Thank Please you. continue. So my second question the carrier was about genetically modified organisms as it relates to fuel production to reach these low carbon fuel standards. And specifically, I have real concerns about how intensive GMO production for biofuels could encroach on farmland used for non-GMO foods, which could increase the costs and decrease the accessibility of non-GMO foods for Oregon consumers. The fact is, in order to sustain biofuel productions at the level it would take to implement these standards, the low carbon fuel standards will require high intensity farming that relies almost singularly on GMO inputs. 
We have had some pretty robust debates on this floor about GMO agriculture. Oregon voters were nearly split down the middle on a GMO labeling bill in 2014 when the, where the argument to not label only won by a few hundred votes. It was the most expensive ballot measure campaign in Oregon's history. So imagine the surprise of all the folks who voted yes on Measure 92 when they realized that SB 324 will rely on a more intensive use of GMOs and an increased need for farmland to help sustain the biofuel capacity needed to reach the low carbon fuel standards and that there will be new concern raised amongst farmers about encroachment on non-GMO farming operations. That is already a hotly debated topic in Oregon without adding to the concerns of citizens on both sides of the GMO issue. But what will happen as farmland across the country is converted to meet energy demands is that the production of non-GMO crops could decrease and the cost of value-added non-GMO products will increase. That means a consumer without the means to make a choice for their family will have less access to foods non-GMO proponents argue are healthier for the individual and the environment. My concerns about the increased production of GMO crops for biofuels has nothing to do with the merits of whether we should or shouldn't produce GMO products for consumption. I shop both conventionally produced foods and organic and non-GMO foods as my budget allows. My concerns stem from SB 324 artificially increasing costs, which means Oregon families will have less resource to make personal food choices for their families. Choice is removed when cost becomes an impediment to making choices. If non-conventionally produced products are indeed better or healthier as their proponents proclaim, then the choice to make those purchases should not be reserved for wealthy individuals only. SB 324 will force some difficult conversations in the near future, both inside and outside of this building, about the rights of a consumer to access foods that are not conventionally produced at a sustainable price. Once again, our food and our fuel supply should never compete. My third question to the carrier was about Oregon's high poverty rate and our struggle to move the dial on unemployment, which is stuck stubbornly higher than the national average. Oregon's efforts to produce green energy jobs has come at an extraordinary cost to Oregon taxpayers. You heard me mention the other day when we had the floor vote to dissolve Cover Oregon that I do not believe Oregon has the managerial capacity nor the skills required to implement large-scale programs and deliver them to Oregon taxpayers in a timely or cost-effective manner. Headlines abound about other failed projects where the legislature and the executive branch took bites at the apple that were too big and in a quest to rush unproven concepts. Rather than working through pilot programs to find scalability that we can roll out to all Oregonians, large-scale programs with poor planning and implementation has cost us untold amounts of money. Cover Oregon, the CRC, Betsy Credits, numerous agency software products, uh, projects, the state radio project, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars lost on things state government never delivered on. Now I liken the low carbon fuel standards to the execution of the Betsy credits, which by all account have been a spectacular failure filled with boondoggles and scams. The difference between the low carbon fuel standards and the Betsy credits is that the cost to the taxpayer once this passes will be very difficult to connect back to our decision at the legislature. The cost increases that an Oregonian will feel won't happen in their tax bill on April 15th. It will be a slow cost creep at the pump in the price of a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread. And who then will they hold accountable? When bills are connected to something tangible that they see was produced by state government, the voters have a mechanism to hold us accountable. By passing off low carbon fuel standard with no fiscal impact statement and a, hit is, and a hidden cost to taxpayers, it's unlikely voters will make the connection that the increased costs they are experiencing aren't because some greedy corporations desire for profits, but rather a decision to implement yet another untested, unpiloted, and unproven program is what's affecting their wallets. Convenient for campaigns, bad for Oregon taxpayers. When our constituents feel the effects in their checkbooks caused by SB 324, it will be because businesses in Oregon are experiencing increased costs that are being passed on to consumers. Representative, one moment. Yes. Representative Huffman yields his time. Please Thank continue. You. As a business owner, I can tell you there are two types of costs that you can try to manage and attempt to remain in business, variable costs and fixed costs. Labor, for most businesses, is a variable cost. If the business can't afford to make ends meet, or if the business has the capacity to automate to reduce costs, then labor is usually the first line item a business will cut, either in the form of hours, benefits, or some combination of both. If I voted yes for this bill, and it meant a constituent of mine lost their job as a result, 
that would be a difficult thing for me to swallow. In a state where we struggle with high unemployment, increasing the cost of doing business in Oregon through SB 324 would be detrimental at this juncture. One of my promises to my constituents, I would work to pass jobs legislation and make that a priority. When somebody in any of our districts has a job, and when someone in any of our districts no longer needs to be one of the 775,000 Oregonians on food stamps, that's a win for my district, and it's a win for the state. So that brings me to my last question to the carrier. What about moving people out of poverty and helping them find upward mobility? SB 324 is a step backward for families, not forward. I grew up in severe poverty. I was asked by the Willamette Week in 2010 what makes me different than the stereotypical Republican. My answer was that I am not opposed to strong social safety net programs. In fact, in this session, there are bills aimed at everything from increasing employment-related daycare expenditures to killing the reduced price meal bracket for school lunch. Having tried to collect nickels from hungry school children as the school food service director, let me tell you, that's not a fun job. So I will be supporting that bill. So on the one hand, uh, we're looking to increase state funds to stave off poverty, but in the same breath, we're deliberating on a bill that will hurt jobs, increase food costs, reduce the buying power of consumers, and send jobs overseas. Colleagues, I have seen some pretty contradictory pieces of legislation in the few terms I've been here, but I've never seen anything like this before, and I'm worried for Oregon's low-income families and those at the lowest end of the middle-class scale. We already have some of the highest income tax brackets in the nation for low-income families. The effects of SB 324 will compound the loss of disposable income available to Oregonians, which hurts families, and I simply can't support that. I've heard talk that SB 324 will create jobs. For whom? I've heard that about solar jobs, wind jobs, and every other form of alternative energy that we've discussed since I've been here. Cool Schools was supposed to create jobs. Maybe there's a few jobs in the mix, but the cost per job based on the taxpayer expenditure hasn't been worth the money. In 2010, right after the election, then Mayor Sam Adams invited members of the legislature from Portland and the surrounding area to come hear his plan for jobs for Portland. And as he talked about jobs, he settled in quite firmly that green jobs and film jobs were the jobs for Portland and where the future was headed. You can imagine I didn't make it through breakfast very long without asking Mayor Adams, what about the Oregonians who will never go into the green energy field? What about their training? What about the access to school to even do those jobs? What about people in East Portland, the neighborhood I grew up in? What was the plan for those citizens, and where were their jobs? And he had no answer. Colleagues, SB 324 may create jobs for a select few, but what about other Oregonians? Where are their jobs? If it drives up the cost for business and the employee's job goes away because their employer can't afford cost increases, then what? That's the prediction for the California Low Carbon Fuel Standards Program. 30,000 to 50,000 jobs lost. Oregon can't afford to sustain similar per capita losses. My kids are the eighth generation of my family to live in this state. Eight generations. Not many people can say that. And I want to see my grandkids be the ninth. And I want to pass to them a state that is beautiful and healthy in the future as it is right now at this moment. I believe in the beauty that is the soul of Oregon. Our open beaches are a hallmark. Our bottle bill, which I voted to expand, is a landmark. We have, thoughtful, we have had thoughtful dialogues on this floor in the four years I've been here about how we preserve our environment and balance the environment with other societal needs. And it has yield, uh, yielded compromises forged in bipartisanship. I simply hate that this bill has come forward with no real plan for how to implement the legislation, no fiscal impact statement, even though it will definitely have an incredible fiscal impact that Oregonians and all of our districts will feel, that SB 324 has been pushed forward as a rollout to the entire state instead of a pilot program that we can learn from with acceptable outcomes we can live with and with no bipartisan spirit that has been the keystone of other important environmental legislation that we've passed on this floor together. We have other bills, particularly some in the alternative forestry legislation this session, like Western Juniper and Urban Forestry, which will have positive environmental impacts and agreed upon consensus that we will be helping the environment. Those bills also have a positive impact for job creation and an eye towards a more sustainable future. SB Representative, yes. one moment. Representative Esquivel Thank yields you. his time. Please I'm continue. I'm almost done. Thank you. So SB 324 does not have those elements. That gives me uh, colleagues, that gives me pause, and I hope it would you too. I have watched us work together through very difficult legislation in the past sessions where we've come together to solve the problem at hand, and I'm disheartened that this bill does not come forward with the same spirit. I started the floor speech with a retelling of promises that I made uh, in my community when I ran for office. 
my final promise, that I would work to pass bills that bring prosperity to my neighbors and that I will vote against bills that harm the ability of my neighbors to raise their kids, feed their families, keep a roof over their heads, or keep them moving forward economically. If I could pass a bill that says milk and bread will always be on sale and that people in my state can afford a chance at a decent and honest life, then I would write that bill. I can't, but I can vote no on SB 324 and then educate Oregonians about how this bill will negatively impact their economic future so they can better prepare for it. My concern is for families who, like Senator Feinstein expressed concern for, are living on the margins, that there is no way to prepare those families for what will inevitably be increased costs and difficult choices for how they spend the limited income they have. I know what it's like to make those choices. I don't wish that anguish on anyone. Colleagues, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I can welcome the continued dialogue, but I caution that unlike the hugely expensive mess created by Cover Oregon, this time on this bill, outside of the public purview, there is no shutoff valve. There is no revisiting by the legislature. There is no accountability to the taxpayer. There is no stopping the bleeding once Oregon families are hit with hidden costs at the pump, increased prices at the store, and the very real threat that their job could leave Oregon or simply go away. I will leave you with one last takeaway. There seems to be an expectation by non-legislative proponents of SB 324 that the voting for green energy and clean fuels bills, Oregon will be at the bleeding edge of technology and environmental public policy. Well, the bleeding edge of uh, energy efficient technology cannot be found in Oregon. Not when we've seen failure after failure in green energy projects with little accountability to the taxpayer for the heavy losses we've incurred. We talk a lot about job creation and courting green companies to our state. If we really want to be impactful on that front, then let's consider the legislation that will make Oregon a leader. SB 324 is not that legislation. Consider this. Tesla Motors, which produces electric cars, some of which can be spotted right here in this capital, has a vision of bringing the cost of electric vehicles to a reasonable price so everyday Americans can have that option in their consideration set as they make the decision to purchase a new automobile. Unfortunately for me, Tesla has yet to produce an electric minivan. So, like many of my soccer mom friends, we'll be stuck in vehicles that will be penalized by SB 324. But Tesla Motors, as they look to create a gigafactory that would yield 6,500 family wage jobs, didn't look at Oregon. In fact, it's unlikely Oregon was ever in the mix. And in fact, if we were, uh, it's highly likely we were not prepared to accommodate Tesla as they move forward with proven and successful technology. Tesla needed 700 uh, acres of site-ready industrial land. They wanted a tax climate that was favorable to the massive growth they're about to experience, one that would reward capital cost they were about to invest in a new state. They needed a DEQ process that would be favorable to siting energy storage facilities so they could make their batteries uh, at the factory on site. They wanted a state that would allow for factory direct sales. And they needed a skilled and educated workforce to meet the demand of where this truly bleeding edge technology is going to drive the market and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels from foreign lands. Nowhere in their list of requirements to cite a new facility as they picked a state was that the state had to have enacted a low carbon fuel standard. And in fact, Oregon, supposedly one of the greenest states in the nation, was never referenced anywhere as being in Tesla's consideration set for the siting of their facility and delivering 6,500 family wage jobs to their new community. Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and even their home state of California were all in the running. They landed in Nevada, not the greenest of states by any stretch of the imagination. What this tells me is that if Oregon is gonna be bold and visionary about green energy, then SB 324 is the wrong vehicle to attract cutting edge companies and sign them on the dotted line to be Oregon companies. Colleagues, we can do better, and I urge a no vote on SB 324. Thank you, Representative. Given some of that content, I think people are hungry. Just to remind you, there is food in the Speaker's office. Further discussion? Representative Buckley. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, colleagues, I, I hope to offer some some uh, to valid comments to the bill. Uh, on, on this bill, I still am kind of reeling a little bit, Madam Speaker, at the thought that I might be uh, doing a pro-GMO vote here uh, today. And I had the image that the uh, representative from uh, East, Far East Oregon put in my head of people in Portland getting around on pogo sticks is also hard to shake. 
But uh, colleagues, Madam Speaker, last summer uh, I drove up to the, uh, the camp, the fire camp, uh, where the firefighters from California and Oregon uh, were based to, to fight the Oregon Gulch fire. And I spent some time talking with a California firefighter who had been in the business for, for over 20 years. And he said something to me that, that was startling. He, he told me that his state no longer has a fire season. They fight fires 12 months of the year. And in his view, and of course he's a firefighter, he's not a scientist, in his view there is only one explanation for the fact that he fights fires now 12 months of every year, and that reason is climate change. Again, he's not a scientist, but when the scientific community is near unanimous on a matter of such grave importance, we probably should listen and heed their advice that climate change is caused by human activity, and we should do what we're capable of doing to address it every chance we have. We here in the Pacific Northwest are lucky to live in a beautiful place. We're surrounded by natural beauty, an abundance of natural resources, including water, a temperate climate, and thriving industries from high-tech manufacturing to agriculture. Studies show the Northwest, and Oregon in particular, is seen as one of the most desirable places to live in the country. But without question, climate change is threatening this natural beauty and our way of life, and we don't, if we don't do something now, the impacts will be disastrous for every sector. Frankly and sadly, much of the damage has already been done, as we've been emitting enormous amounts of greenhouse gases unchecked for more than a century. For the health and the prosperity of the next generation, we have a responsibility to act. The destructive impacts of climate change aren't just in some far-off future. Here are the impacts that are happening already on our ag and natural resource industries. Decreasing snowpacks mean less water for irrigation in the summer months in, and in the dry parts of the state. Eventually, it will be more difficult in many parts of our state to grow the kinds of crops that are central to the rural Oregon economy. Changes in steam flows will impact fish populations like salmon, steelhead, and trout. Rising temperatures further threaten those species' habitats. Warmer springs and summers, coupled with changes in rain, will lead to increased flooding, particularly in basin areas. Sea levels will rise, threatening our coastal communities and businesses. Increased acidity in the ocean will threaten our commercial fishing industry. And our forests are already more vulnerable to wildfires and insect infestations like pine beetles. All told, colleagues, billions of dollars of economic vitality are at stake. And that's not to mention, even to mention the public health costs from increased asthma, COPD, and other ailments that will come as a result of worsening air pollution. Colleagues, we have a responsibility to act now to lessen these impacts any way we can. That's why we began this work in 2009 by passing a low carbon fuel standard. Like many of you, I was here when we passed it. The bill was a recognition that even if we alone can't solve the problem, we have to do what we can to limit our contribution to it. The bill we passed six years ago under Governor Kulangoski laid the groundwork for this effort. State agencies, stakeholders, and members of the business community have spent the last six years in, a, in work groups and in public hearings working out the details of this program. It's been through years of process with many voices involved. Madam Speaker, colleagues, it's time to lift the sunset on the clean, clean fuels program so we can immediately begin implementation. I urge you to join me in voting aye. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative, for the discussion. Representative Witt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, to the bill. To the bill. Colleagues, we encounter a host of bills and their attendant issues each and every session. Some of these bills unite us. Many more receive our passive consent. Still others are restrained opposition. And a notable few are so discordant that they give rise to the two Oregons, one urban and one rural. Senate Bill 324 is one such divisive bill. By creating a scarcity of resources, the very basis by which fuel credits become a valuable commodity and thereby saleable, means double and even triple jeopardy for much of rural Oregon. To begin with, 
It is common for liquid fuels prices to be 20 cents per gallon more expensive in the rural portions of our state than here in our capital city or most anywhere else in metropolitan Oregon. Next, double or even triple that 20 cents do the fuels cost increases Senate Bill 324 will cause and the pain begins to become palpable. Factor in the additional 90 cents per gallon gasoline cost increase that has occurred at my neighborhood gas station since the session started. 90 cents in one month. And we're back to pre-Bakken fuels prices. And fuels prices continue to rise on a daily basis. Now imagine having to commute over 100 miles per day. It's a 135-mile round trip from Klaskenai to Portland and back to go to work because jobs in our heritage industries, namely fishing, farming, and forestry, have disappeared because of previous and ongoing poor public policy decision-making. It's little wonder that so many rural Oregonians have so many problems with this bill and can't understand why the other Oregon continues to inflict so much economic pain upon them. Not unlike a litany of other state-run big-ticket projects that have turned into highly embarrassing and costly busts over recent decades, I am greatly concerned about the lack of process and competency exhibited by the developers of Senate Bill 324 to date. In the past four years, I have been assured by proponents of the bill that an effective and timely means of abating excessive fuels cost increases caused by the legislation would be developed. Four years later, as I stand here, that is yet to occur which raises several red flags for me. First, broken commitments mean broken trust as far as I'm concerned. I have little faith that the program is ready for rollout, that all the necessary safeguards are in place, or that the advocates are capable of managing that which they have created. Secondly, a demonstrated inability to develop an effective abatement formula gives me little confidence that the proponents are competent to administer the complex energy credit system laid out in the bill. This leads me to the third red flag. Senate Bill 324, also known as the Clean Fuels Bill, is supposed to make more clean fuels available to consumers. This is a thoroughly admirable goal, but here is the rub. Among our more traditional fuels, it's already mission accomplished. Try finding any non-ethanol gasoline these days. Representative Witt, one moment. Representative Boone yields her time. Thank you, good representative. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You can't find any. Just ask all the upset boaters, snowmobilers, and small engine enthusiasts around my district if there is any unblended gasoline to be had. And for those consumers who've moved on to electric cars, propane, or a host of non-traditional fuels, it's been market forces read transportation costs that are leading to newer and cleaner alternatives. With consumers unable to significantly reduce their individual carbon footprints on the one hand, while fuels costs threaten to rise substantially on the other, little remains of Senate Bill 324's original promise. 
But what does remain is an energy tax credit system run by the state. And that is my fourth red flag. The last time Oregon got involved in something remotely similar, it was a disaster. You may remember the business energy tax credit venture of the early 2000s, initially estimated to cost Oregon taxpayers $3 million per project with an original sunset date of 2012. The project's costs have spiraled out of control with final payments being made on July 1st of last year. The final costs are still being calculated and current accounting shows $947 million in project credits, the most generous in our nation. Colleagues, I consider reductions in carbon pollution essential to long-run global stability, economically, socially, and environmentally. I applaud the sponsors of Senate Bill 324 for their efforts in committing our state to its fair share of carbon reduction. Unfortunately, however, the proposed legislation has too many shortcomings to allow it to become law. And because of that, I urge your no vote on Senate Bill 324A. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, Madam Speaker. If the low carbon fuel standard is, um, is to be as beneficial for Oregon as the proponents claim it will be, shouldn't this be mandated for all 50 states in the union? Um, I would love to see this program be mandated in 50 states in the union. Um, what we, but we, what we are working with is what we have here, which is an opportunity to put this uh, program forward in Oregon. We do know that our neighbors on the West Coast, British Columbia, California, um, soon Washington will be moving to the uh, Clean Fields program, which will allow us to have the fifth largest economy in the world using clean fuels, which um, the hope is we will um, move our nation and even global movement towards this kind of standard. More follow-up, please. Follow-up, does the carrier yield? Yes. She does. Thank you for that answer. So with that in mind, what assurances might there be that there would be adequate supplies to meet national demand for biofuels if, in fact, Oregon, Washington, California, British Columbia all create this critical mass, and could all 50 states be serviced by a biofuel program as well? Thank you um, for that question. So I, I believe I answered a similar question earlier today. Um, in January of this year, the International Center for Clean Transportation, the ICCT, released a study to look at whether or not there's going to be enough commercially available fuel to meet the low carbon fuel standards for the entire West Coast. Um, all of those states that I just, and British Columbia that I just listed. The study found that there is enough low carbon in the market today to, Im to supply the West Coast, and we'll be looking out into the 10 years that this program will be implemented um, to, to reduce it. So it's well above the current targets that we're shooting for with the Clean Fuels program. Thank you. To the bill. To the bill. Colleagues, I asked those questions because, um, am I still on? There we go. I believe it's clear that Oregon, and if in fact we partner, or if the rest of our West Coast partners are also adopt similar regulations that uh, for just our states alone, the world is gonna have a very, very difficult time satisfying and providing the appetite that there will be, or the mandates that there will be for providing alternative fuels. And I'm gonna explain in my next uh, couple of pages here exactly what I'm talking about. You know, the low carbon fuel standard was originally passed in 2009, and we've heard arguments today from the proponents of the policy that uh, there's really no need to question or examine the underlying principles because the low carbon standard has now been with us for six years, and carbon emissions continue to grow worldwide, so we must move forward now because it'll be good for the planet. But six years is a long time. And there have been some pretty significant changes since 2009 in our world. Thanks to smart drilling techniques, the U.S. now has the ability to influence the price of petroleum in the world. The huge amounts of gas and oil that we are producing domestically have dramatically changed the energy landscape that existed in 2009. 
The fear that once gripped this nation in the early years of this century regarding energy independence, and that led then President Bush to strongly push for increasing biofuel production as a means of strengthening our national defense are really no longer valid. But the low carbon fuel standard bill in 2009 was really a reaction to this attitude. We wanted to do something. We wanted to try to create our own homegrown uh, energy, energy uh, economy. But there have been some other very, very important changes as well in the last six years. You see, the world's experience with and attitudes about biofuels to supplement traditional fuel products have changed dramatically as well. I call your attention to a, a report that, or a story that was in the New York Times on January 28th of this year. Maybe some of you had a chance to see this, but the headline says, New report urges Western governments to reconsider the reliance on biofuels. First, it starts by this. It says, Western governments have made a wrong turn in energy policy by supporting the large-scale conversion of plants to fuel and should reconsider that strategy, according to a new report from a prominent environmental think tank. Quote, I would say that many of the claims for biofuels have been dramatically exaggerated, says Andrew Steer, president of the World Resources Institute. I might add parenthetically, this is the same institute that uh, former Portland Mayor Sam Adams is now employed by. <coughs> A global research organization based in Washington that has published this report. Quote, there are other more effective routes to get to a low carbon world. Moreover, biofuels are an inefficient way to convert sunlight to fuel, meaning an immense amount of land is required to supply a significant fraction of global energy demand. That land will also be needed to help meet a global appetite for food that is expected to rise by 70% or so by 2050. We've only got one planet <clears throat> with only so much land if you use land for one purpose, you can't use it for another. Global opinions are changing, Oregonians. We have to understand that. Sometimes we get locked in this building, we end up with a bit of a bubble mentality and we forget what's going on out there. But the civilized world is moving away from biofuels as a mean to meet energy demand. Because when some of the biofuels that now are available don't meet e DEQ's new guidelines, i.e. corn ethanol, where will we turn? We just heard cellulosic ethanol mentioned as a, an example. The only, the main producer for, the main source for cellulosic ethanol that's on the market today comes from sugarcane. The primary source for the derivation of this or the derivative of this eth cellulosic ethanol comes from Sugarcane grown in Brazil. Sugarcane is not a naturally appearing crop in Brazil, but they're growing a heck of a lot of it as they clear cut the rainforest to plant sugarcane so that we can use that product in our gas tanks here in North America. And that's a fact. But I thought Senate Bill 24, 2, 324 was about clean fuels, right? I mean, it has this kind of feel good component to it. I mean, who doesn't want clean water, clean air? Yeah, so let's talk about what the DEQ is going to do in the credit system. So first of all, they are going to provide the technology system on which the credits will be bought and sold. They'll certify that the credits um, um, meet the environmental standards that are needed in order to qualify um, to be considered as a credit. Um, this, the sale and the purchase of those credits is going to be a private business transaction between the regulated parties and the credit generators. Um, and then in terms of the credits, um, as they're bought and sold through the brokers, those brokers will be registered with DEQ. Follow-up? Follow-up, does the carrier yield? I do. She does. Uh, thank you. My understanding is that DEQ is, has looked at the California LCS, LCFS program as a potential model with respect to credits and DEQ has projected only a need for an additional 1.5 FTE in implementing the credit program. Uh, do you trust DEQ's estimation of the cost of the program that would actually only require 1.2 FTE? So I believe the actual number is 2.5 FTE. That's what we heard in committee. And um, the if we're, um, and there's a couple of reasons why they're only going to need 2.5 employees. First of all, when we raise the exemption for the fuel importers 
um, who would be required to comply with the program. There's only 60 companies within Oregon that are going to need to comply. Um, so that's a relatively small number of companies. Um, much of the work has already been done. They have finished the phase two rulemaking with this, so a lot of that work is ready to go. And again, in setting up the virtual marketplace through the online system, a lot of that, what they're going to be do will be automated. So in um, our committee hearing, DEQ felt confident that 2.5 people would be sufficient to manage the program. Thank you. One more follow-up. Another follow-up. Does the carrier yield? I do. She does. Thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned the committee because my understanding uh, is that DEQ provided, uh, even though they have been working on this apparently for years, provided committee members with factually incorrect information uh, in the hearing and then emailed committee members after the close of business hours last Friday with apparently correct information. In light of, first of all, is that true? Second, in light of that, um, that apparently they don't know their own information that they've supposed to have known for months, that are you still confident in their ability to implement the LCFS trading credit program in Oregon? So I believe that was two questions, so I do yield to both of those questions. <laughs> and um, yes, so I think it's the fact that they have worked with this program for so long that led to the error um, in the information that they gave in committee. Um, what they did is they were referring to uh, numbers that they had been using in the, in the rulemaking process up to, um, up to the, the phase two rulemaking. So they were, they, uh, what was quoted was the 2011 standards. And, and you know, this is you know, information and, and numbers that they'd been using for a long time, but because this is a science-based program, you know, they use their updated information. And so that, the updated information, the most updated information is what's used in the current standards. They did send an email out about that, uh, correcting the problem as soon as it was discovered. Um, that was distributed to all the committee members and it's been distributed to all members of this body with a, with a um, letter that's on your desk today. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, questions of the carrier. Question of the carrier. Does the carrier yield? Yes, she does. Thank you. What prevents third parties from cornering the market on credits and driving the costs up in the long term for both producers and sellers? By third parties, are you referring to the brokers? Yes. All right. Um, so the way that the broker, um, what prevents, can you repeat the question, what prevents them from driving up the cost? Yeah, by cornering the market. Okay. Um, so brokers themselves can only purchase and retain credits if they're given explicit authority by the regulated entity and the credit generator. Um, so they're not, they're not allowed to hold on to credits or they're simply acting as, as the middleman in the credit generators who are producing the, the credits and the regulated parties that are required to buy them. Okay. Follow up, please. Follow up. Does the carrier yield? Yes. She does. What happens if there's not sufficient credits to meet demand? Um, if there's not sufficient credits to meet the demand that's required? That's yes. required. Yep. So the um, right now we're gonna th that is like, that's what the market will do in terms of setting the price for the credits. So just like in any other market system, if there's not enough, if the supply and demand will drive the price of the credit. So if there's not enough, the price will grow up, go up. But um, as I stated before, estimates are for Oregon specifically and for the entire West Coast, there will be enough credits for the program. In fact, in California, they right, currently have a surplus of credits um, that they, are, that they ha need for the program. But uh, follow up? Follow up question, please. Thank you. Does the carrier yield? Yes. She does. But, but what safeguards are in place to make sure that the market doesn't spin out of control, the credits zooming up quite high? We've seen this in California with a lot of volatility in just a six month period. The credits went from $80 and back down to 20 yeah, so that's actually one of the great things about this bill is that it puts cost containment measures um, into the program, cost containment measures that are currently not anywhere a part of how we're um, buying gas and diesel today. So there are three ways that we, there are actually off ramps to the program. One has to do if there's some kind of catastrophic event that limits the, um, the availability of, of fuel in general. Um, two is if there's not enough alternative fuels that are available. And then three would be um, the direction to, to the EQC to set in rule 
the cost containment mechanism, which would be a price ceiling on the cost of the credit. So that will be set, there will be a, a ceiling on the credit, and that itself will prevent the price from spiraling out of control. And a final question, please. And a final question, do you yield? I do. She does. Can you give me examples elsewhere in our economy where price controls such as you just described have been successful? No, I, I don't have any. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker, colleagues. Question of the carrier. Question of the carrier, does the carrier yield? I do. She does. Thank you. A question I kick off with here today is the intent of this program to have fuel prices increase to have consumers consider alternative modes of transportation. No, the intent of this program is to require a 10% reduction in the carbon intensity of, of uh, transportation fuels in the next 10 years. All right, thank you. Uh, how about the impact on- Follow up, follow, uh, follow up, does the carrier yield? She does? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, the impact on rural communities, do you see that being different than in urban areas? Could you describe the disparity? So any um, impacts to the price of fuel will be same, the same for everyone across the state. Um, in addition, uh, rural Oregon is well positioned to take advantage of the clean fuel economies that would um, grow as a result of this bill. Thank you. Follow up? Follow up. Does the carrier yield? I do. She does. I'd like to talk to you a bit about the uh, initial bill uh, compared to the bill that we have before us today. One thing that is obvious, this new bill, 324A, is something more than a lifting of a sunset. A uh, question that I have about that is when we look at the original bill, we see on page 3, and it's line 16, the provisions of this section do not apply to, and in the original bill, it used to say motor vehicles registered as farm vehicles, farm tractors, implements of husbandry, motor trucks, and so on and so forth. But I notice in the new bill, 324A, there is new language added to line 16. Instead of just saying the provisions of this section do not apply to, and then naming the uh, other items. It says now the provisions of this section do not apply to fuel that is demonstrated to have been used in any of the following. And then it goes on to talk about motor vehicles registered as farm vehicles, farm tractors, implements of husbandry, and so forth. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Fuel that is demonstrated to have been used in any of the following. Demonstrated, I'm, I'm interested in that word. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I got this one ahead of time, though. Um, so what that means is um, the, the people who are the fuel distributors for the state are going to be required to track how much um, of the fuel that they sell is, is given to these exempted, um, exempted uses. So um, as you mentioned, there are all of those that you listed as well as some additional ones like um, watercraft. Um, and um, that and those, um, the sale of the fuel to those folks will not be considered as part of their uh, carbon intensity for their fuels that they sell. So that will be taken out of the entire equation in determining the number of credits that they're going to need to purchase in order to make up for the, the fuel that they sell. All right. Thank you. And follow up? Follow up. Does the carrier yield? I do. She does. Let me ask you, is there any relationship at all between the amount someone will pay for fuel under the LCFS and the amount of carbon that they actually create? So just to reiterate, the um, consumers are not um, consumers of fuels are not um, uh, regulated by this. This is going to be the fuel importers for whom this will um, apply, as well as the credit generators in the clean fuel economy. Um, so with that, they will not um, there there wouldn't be the difference. Could you repeat that last part of the question? I want to make sure I answer your question. Yeah, the uh, the question is really what uh, what does the word demonstrated mean in context of this bill? Fuel that is demonstrated to have been used in any of the following. Oh yeah, but I'm sorry. The question about the relationship between the amount somebody will pay, and and the amount of carbon that they create. Yeah. yeah so um, so the um, the fuel importers were, are they're the ones who are going to be required to pay the amount. Um, for the carbon. So it, it is exactly related to the amount of carbon in the fuels that they're importing. That will determine how many credits that the, they'll have to pay. That's the, that's the beauty of the system. All right. Very good. Thank you. And to the bill. To the bill. 
I'd like to take a moment, and I'm not going to take long here today, to uh, read testimony from someone who actually is in the cattle business, who is in a business that not many of us here in this building can relate to. I'd like to read a bit of that testimony from this individual. The increased cost of LCFS will threaten the economic viability and continuity of our family ranch. Everything in our rural community requires extended distances for delivery, from fencing supplies to seed to fertilizer, plus the multitude of other inputs needed for efficient cattle production, even down to the groceries we buy. Today, this individual says, I travel 324 miles to testify at this hearing. Distances of 150 miles are common for the movement of our cattle to pasture and delivery of our cattle and commodities. If LCFS is imposed, we'll have great difficulties. The financial margin, uh, margin rather, of ranching operations is thin because of the risk of weather and tremendous capital outlays required, along with the exposure and volatility of the markets. The LCFS will most definitely diminish our chance at profitability and continuing economic stability. Already we endure the consequences of the current ethanol blend gasoline and biodiesel mixture. We cannot use E10 gasoline in our irrigation or small engine equipment as the corrosive effects of the ethanol will ruin the engine components, which means downtime and expensive repairs. We currently have to special purchase ethanol-free gasoline, which at times can be a dollar or more per gallon increase over regular ethanol blended gas. Consider this. In November 2014, we experienced minus 15 degree weather. The current biodiesel mixture we have to use in our cattle feeding equipment gelled, and our diesel-powered tractors would not start or run. Only after a multitude of fuel filter changes and many hours of mechanical work with external heat applied, we were able to get our cattle fed. Well over 1,000 head of cattle were dependent on our ability to feed and take care of them through those terribly cold days. This is a responsibility of animal husbandry, and we take that very seriously. Now I'd like to take a moment to talk about a subject that is not extremely popular here. It was only a few days ago, colleagues, that we took the time to honor someone who had served this chamber selflessly for many, many years. In the course of those accolades, the love and respect for this place and the process was mentioned numerous times. And today we have an opportunity to show the same kind of love and respect for the legislative process. Colleagues, I'm sure that all of you honor this place and I know that you feel privileged to serve here. Today we have the opportunity to keep this honor intact and with the legislative process as well. When the heart of Senate Bill 324 became subject of federal suspicion, even mentioned by name in a federal subpoena, it seemed it was the perfect time to send this bill away. The perfect time. A new governor, a new way of doing business, cutting the ties to corporate cronyism, and getting rid of every appearance of wrongdoing. Restoring the public trust is a phrase that I heard. Restoring the public trust, what a beautiful aim and goal for all of us here in this chamber. But so far, it is a missed opportunity. But being an eternal optimist, I'm still believing, I'm believing that many of you in your heart of hearts really want to restore public trust. And you know that this is a golden opportunity to do that. Colleagues, it does matter what it looks like as we do business in this building. News outlets all over Oregon have fulfilled their obligations to readers, viewers, and their hearers trying to flag this body down on this issue. This is Oregon. This is not Illinois. This bill, like many around here, accentuates the urban-rural divide, and once again, rural Oregon gets an elbow to the side of the head. Excuse me, Representative. Representative Fagan, for what purpose are you in the queue? Madam Speaker, I would ask you to please advise the a representative to please not impugn the motives of the entire body or of other members. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Wilson, you are skating close to being reprimanded. Please be careful. Thank you. 
Bicycles, public transit, and electric cars are not big in a wide expanse of rural Oregon, and they never will be. Scores of aging internal combustion engines will continue to do the heavy lifting in feeding Oregon's residents, especially urban residents. Oregon farmers operate on a tight margin and are extremely sensitive to fuel price increases. These increased prices cannot be easily passed on to the consumer, most of them in the urban area. Urban dwellers, by comparison, Excuse have me, Representative, my apologies. Representative Hack yields her time. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Urban dwellers, by comparison, have better roads generally to drive on and generally shorter distances to travel. They can rely on public transit, including trolleys, buses, and bicycles, and goodness knows, cowboy boots and bicycles don't mix, especially in rural Oregon. Oregonians know that the low carbon fuel standard will drive up their fuel costs, and media outlet after media outlet has warned the public about that. This is one of those bills where you have to pass it to know what it does. And we're about ready to design another Da Vinci airplane. And I think we've done enough of that in Oregon lately. I hope you'll please vote no on Senate Bill 324A. Thank you, Madam Speaker. When our added costs come, you and I will be paying for more fuel, or we'll be paying a higher price for the fuel. No one disputes that. Where are those investments going to go? OK, so, um, so thank you for clarifying that. I, um, the, any potential costs that might be seen for consumers would just be any um, additional prices that would be passed along con to consumers from the fuel importers. They are the people who are, they are the entities that are um, a part of the clean fuels program. They are the ones who need to comply with the regulations of having, um, reaching, reaching the carbon intensity of the fuels that they sell. And they can do that um, by, through blending at the levels at which are currently in statute, or if they aren't able to do that, if it is more cost effective for them, they can um, purchase clean fuel credits on the market. So they're the ones who have to comply with that. Um, if they would like to pass along the cost of those credits to consumers through gas, they can do that, but they, are, that they don't have to do that. Thank you. Follow up? Follow up. Does a carrier yield? I do. She does. Uh, my final question is, if a company is able to generate monetary credits through low carbon fuel standard, is there any requirements to invest the proceeds in expansion of their business in Oregon? Um, no, as I'm, as, thank you for the question. So as I had said before, um, well, first of all, if you are, if you're generating the gas, if you're selling the gasoline in Oregon, you are going to be, um, you are required to um, follow the program. Um, but for the people who are generating the clean air credits, um, that they that they can sell you can um, It's not a requirement that that has to be done in Oregon Although we have a lot of industries that are poised to go ahead and take advantage of the program once it's implemented So uh, colleagues this program has had has been more than six years in the making since 2009 it has had 10 legislative public hearings and 10 legislative committee work sessions through the rulemaking process it has had 15 full day advisory committee meetings and three public hearings hosted by the environmental quality commission we know that deq stands ready to move ahead with this program uh, when we pass this bill there's no need to refer it to committee representative mike mclean thank you madam speaker to the motion to the motion Colleagues, we've not had six years. The chairman of the committee, a representative from East Portland, has repeatedly said this is six years in the making. Permission to use visual aid. Representative McLean requests the use of a visual aid. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Colleagues, this is a floor letter. If you'll read it, it says, the history of the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. It's on your desk. It's from the DEQ website. This bill has not been six years in the making. This program, excuse me, has not been six years in the program, uh, making. It says right there. In fact, the history of the Oregon Clean Fuels Program, and you go down April 2012. In April 2012, Governor Kitzhopper asked DEQ to begin 
the rulemaking process for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. This bill has, this program has not been six years in the making. If you look on DEQ's site, the handout that I've shown you, January 7, 2015, not even two months ago, DEQ adopted phase two rules for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. This bill has not been six years in the making. This program is two months old. This program was promulgated by an agency, and the rules were just adopted two months ago. And now we have the same DEQ giving false information, corrective, correctifying it after 5 o'clock on a Friday. I urge us to send this back to the committee so we can properly vet this program based upon correct information from DEQ, a program whose rules were adopted two months ago. Thank you, Representative. Further discussion on the motion to re-refer, Representative Widener. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the motion. To the motion. Colleagues, I sat on the committee, and I've listened to a lot of the debate that's happened on this floor, and uh, I, too, believe we need to refer this back to committee because I think there's a lot of members who truly don't understand how this program works and what's going on with the program. With the clean fuels, we're talking about 10% of the blend. That's all it will ever be, is 10%. So you're 90% of regular fuel, but you're blending 10%. Right now, we use corn-based ethanol. I heard the mention of using hemp. Excuse me, Representative. Representative Buckley, for what purpose are you in the privilege queue? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm just wondering if the discussion is on the motion to refer the bill or on the content of the bill, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Representative. It is about the motion to refer, so tie it back to that, please. To refer back to committee and why we need to do it from the discussion that's happened on this floor, Madam Speaker. Please continue. So, colleagues, it's 10% that we blend. That number never changes. Okay, it's how do we get that up, that number up. And I heard the mention of using hemp, things like that. It doesn't get you there. It's like going from 80% alcohol to 190 is where we need to go. Representative, the purpose of the motion is to re-refer, so try to get to that point, please. I am on my way there. So it's a long and lengthy process to get there. So I've heard colleagues talk about blending different things to get there, and it doesn't get us there. Okay, we've talked about the California program. This is another reason we need to refer this back to committee. California has the second highest gas prices in the nation. They started at 99, and with the handout that we had earlier, members, we're starting at 89. California started at 99. We're already 10% below California right now, and I don't know if everybody has clearly vetted this and understand this point, and it's something that needs to be weighed out in committee because we never got a clear answer in committee. We asked DEQ over and over, and the number changed even between them when they were sitting there. So then we get emails that we show up on Monday morning after we had the hearings. So we never got a chance to go back and question DEQ on these numbers. Colleagues, we're the sixth, fifth or sixth highest gas prices in the nation right now. This is going to put us at possibly number two, number three in the nation for our gas prices. So. I'm asking that we refer this back to committee and we think of Oregonians and what we're going to do to the cost of gasoline and hurting working families. I urge us to send this back to committee and that we take a serious look at this so we can drive the cost of fuel down, not drive the cost of fuel up for our citizens of Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, Representative.
The motion to re-refer Senate Bill 324 to the Committee on Energy and Environment, having not received the required majority, is declared failed. <laughs> Representative McLean, for what purpose are you here to speak on the main bill, Senate Bill 324, or? Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 324 be postponed indefinitely. Or a motion. Representative McLean moves Senate Bill 324 be postponed indefinitely. To your motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Why postpone? Because there are two things that we face, colleagues. Two decisions to make. One is about the process, and the second is about the policy. The reason why I advocate today that we postpone is because I don't believe that this body should, at this time, make this decision to make permanent this controversial program because of what we know going on in the executive branch and what we don't know. Oregonians are frustrated. Permission to use a visual aid. Representative McLean asks permission to use a visual aid. Seeing no objection, so ordered. Madam Speaker, as you know, I sent you a letter on February 18, urging that the vote that we're having today be postponed. Permission to read that letter. Feel free. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Due to the many investigations surrounding Sylvia Hayes, for among other things, lobbying the former governor, and influencing state agencies on the development of the Clean Fuels Program, and whether that influence violated ethical and criminal laws. House Republicans request that any vote in the House of Representatives on Senate Bill 324 be postponed until all investigations are complete and the information derived therefrom made public. This is the only way that House members can evaluate Senate Bill 324 on the merits of the program alone and without this fog around how it was created. As you may have pledged in the past, as you have pledged in the past, uh, past Madam Speaker, the House must be transparent and fully involve the public in our review of bills. Senate Bill 324 does not meet that standard. Do we know how the Clean Fuels Program was influenced by Ms. Hayes and who paid her to do it? Do we know how those who paid Ms. Hayes benefit from a permanent Clean Fuels Program? Do we know who else in state government may have violated state or federal laws as to this program? What other out-of-state interests have invested money to promote this program and how would they benefit from its passage? There are many more questions to ask. Shouldn't the public know that those facts, know of those facts, excuse me, before the House votes to implement such a controversial program that will undoubtedly raise fuel prices for all Oregonians? With criminal subpoenas just issued that cover numerous persons and agencies, we must allow the investigative process to take place before we vote on Senate Bill 324. I concluded, today Governor Brown said we must seize this moment to work across party lines to restore the public's trust. In that spirit, please let me know whether you will agree to, lay hold, uh, agree to hold any vote on Senate Bill 324 until the public and House members have the information outlined above. 
with five months left in the session, why would we rush this bill through the House? Madam Speaker, I appreciate that you send a letter back to me, it, very cordial, disagreeing that the House should put this on hold. Indeed, after I sent that letter, there have been some questions about the very premise, about why we should put this on hold, and I want to address some of those. The first is the frustration of Oregonians that we are even proceeding today. Behind me are just examples of editorial headlines that range from Portland to Eugene to the Portland Tribune, Albany Democrat Herald, urging us to put this on hold. Here are some of the quotes from the headlines, colleagues of local editorial boards from Oregon newspapers asking us not to vote on Senate Bill 324 at this time. The Albany Herald, or the Albany Democrat Herald wrote, in addition, the clean fuels program is exactly the sort of consulting. Excuse me, sorry, excuse me, Representative. Uh, Representative Krieger yields his time, please continue. Thank you. Exactly. <clears throat> the sort of consulting that Kitsopper's fiance, Sylvia Hayes, was tackling. You would think the scandal would give lawmakers ample reason to steer clear for the time being of anything that might have Hayes' fingerprints on it. The Oregonian wrote, quote, despite the cost and complexity of the fuel standard, removing the 2015 sunset date has continued to be a priority of the environmental left. Kitsopper in a nonprofit that sent tens of thousands of dollars to fiance Sylvia Hayes way. There is no question that the policy encoded in Senate Bill 324 is enveloped thoroughly by the ethical fog generated by Oregon's outgoing first couple. The Oregonian further wrote, supported tainted legislation that affected good policy would be bad enough supporting tainted legislation that creates bad policy and hinders the pursuit of good policy would be inexplicable. Supporters of Senate Bill 324 should be prepared for some hard conversation with constituents. And the Portland Tribune writes, it has become impossible to separate Kitsopper's push for reduced carbon standards from Hayes' paid work on behalf of advocates of those standards. The Statesman Journal writes, if Senate Bill 324 is, a worthwhile, is as worthwhile as supporters contend, there's no need to rush it in the legislature. There will be time for the potential effects to be validated by reputable, independent, disinterested analysts who have no political, ideological, or financial interests in the outcome. Legislators should have learned from the Cover Oregon debacle that trying to be a national leader without doing the proper homework and supervision can backfire badly. That was a quote from Slow Down Oregon Legislators on Greenhouse Gas Bill from the Statesman Journal on February 4 of this year. Oregonians are frustrated, Madam Speaker. They're frustrated and they want this bill put on hold. The motion to postpone comes at this time after a rigorous debate when it's clear that many questions remain. And we need to know who influenced who and was that influence improper or illegal. Some of the other objections that have come up about postponing it. Madam Speaker, may I read from the floor exhibit? Go right ahead. Thank you. The floor exhibit that I just mentioned, folks, our colleagues, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality's website. Now, my good friend from Beaverton, 
Representative Reed and I were on uh, television together. He is tall and nice looking, and sitting next to me made me look short and fat. But nevertheless, we had a rigorous debate. But Representative Reed said then, it's been going since 2009. Governor Kulingoski passed this. There's no reason for delay. My good friend from Ashland, our Ways and Means Chair, a man I admire, also has said repeatedly, there's no need to delay. This has been going since 2009. The chair of our very committee that held just one hearing and then the next hearing moved the bill said it's been going for six years. And yet the very DEQ says clearly on their website that the history of the Oregon Clean Fuels Program began in 2009 by a bill that simply said, we need to do this. But of course it never said, what are we going to do? And the reason we should postpone this bill today is because the history of this program emanates only in the last few years. The history of what we should do, not whether, whether this program should exist, but what's it going to do to your family and my family and your community and my community? Representative, one moment. Representative Parrish yields her time. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If you look at this handout, it says clearly, it was in April 2012 the Governor Kitzhopper asked DEQ to begin the rulemaking process for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. Begin. Begin. And as you can see from these dates, on December 7, 2012, Phase 1 rules came out. And on January 7, 2015, not yet Two months ago, phase two rules came out. So this program doesn't come from Kulingos Governor Kulingoski. The bill to direct DEQ to tell us what this program does came by directive in 2009 by this body. The program and how it affects your family and my family those rules are fairly recent. And they came out in a time in which a cloud, as the Oregonian put it, had emerged. I want to point out, colleagues, that other floor letters, like from the Oregon Business Association, and I quote from the OBA's letter, as leaders in the Oregon business community, we have evaluated the clean fuels program beginning in 2009. I got to wonder what they were reading in 2009, in 2010, in 2011, in 2012, because it wasn't in 2012 that this program started its process of figuring out these rules. So, the next criticism of why we should not delay has been there's no reason. There's no connection to any of the governor's behavior or his administration or Ms. Hayes to Senate Bill 329. In fact, I want to quote the majority leader of the Senate, a Portland Democrat named Diane Rosenbaum. She said, this is nonsense. There is no link between Sylvia Hayes and the clean fuels programs. It's nonsense. Multiple environmental groups have come out and said, there's absolutely no link, no evidence between Ms. Hayes and the clean fuels program. This is simply political posturing. Well, colleagues, there is evidence, and I want to methodically go through it to show that this bill must be postponed. Wow. 
Colleague, there's things that we know and things that we don't know. This is what we know. Number one, Miss Hayes was paid, paid by interested parties to lobby in favor of the clean fuels program. We know this. Ms. Hayes has indicated in an email that, despite resistance, was recently released, where she indicated that she was one of the originators of the governor's 10-year clean fuel programs, one of the key authors in the 10-year energy plan, excuse me. And one of the key elements of the governor's 10-year energy plan is the low carbon fuel standard program or this clean fuels program. This is also known. After proposed rules came out, the Western Petroleum Association met with the governor to discuss these proposed rules and impacts of the very program that would be permanently imposed upon families all over Oregon with Senate Bill 324. The governor and Margie Hoffman was there, Margie Hoffman being the 10-year energy advisor. And also present was Sylvia Hayes. Now, Ms. Hayes was active in that meeting. Active in the meeting. Excuse me. One moment, please, Representative. Representative Barreto yields his time. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker active in the meeting, helping shape it. Now, we don't know all that happened, but we do know that is an additional fact. And finally, or I should say not finally, we know that a subpoena has been issued by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Madam Speaker, I'd like to use an additional visual aid. Representative McLean, ask permission to use, continue use of a visual aid. Please go forward. Thank you. Colleagues, this is just a blow up of some parts of the subpoena that's been issued by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Why does this vote need to be postponed? Because we have a criminal investigation occurring in Oregon. This subpoena was issued. It's been issued to develop evidence. The criminal subpoena indicates that a federal grand jury has been convened. And it talks about what that means. And it's asking for documents. And as you can see behind me, one of the information as to communications between Ms. Hayes and the governor and Palmer Mason at DEQ, they asked for those same documents at the Demar uh, Department of Environment and Quality. And right here, right here in the subpoena, they want documents about the low carbon fuel standards, clean energy and coal. Right there, this program is named. Senator Rosenbaum, nonsense? No evidence? Further, Ms. Hayes has sued the Oregonian to stop her emails from being disclosed. And one of her bases is the Fifth Amendment. Now, it's her right to do that. And she should do that. But it also indicates that there is serious implication associated to what, to or what the Oregonian wants to discover about her communications. And finally, colleagues, we have two glaring facts that have contributed to what the Oregonian called this fog. We had our Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate ask for the resignation of our governor. 
Madam Speaker, you've given your reasons publicly. I respect you. I don't agree with the decision. I respect President Courtney, but I don't agree with his decision at that time unless there was information that we didn't know. But ignoring what was going on, our Speaker, the President of the Senate, asked the Governor to resign because the investigations that have was so clouded concerning the governor and Ms. Hayes in this activity rendered him incapable of fulfilling his constitutional duties. And then the governor resigned. So, is that no evidence? Well, one thing's for sure. It certainly is not enough evidence to convict Ms. Hayes of any criminal activity at this point. I'm not saying that. In fact, I want her to have the process that every Oregonian should have. But I am saying this. Given what the Oregonian has called a cloud, given the surrounding aspects of not knowing who else in state government has been influenced? Who else may have been paid improperly, if not illegally? Are we prepared to go today to a vote? Excuse me, Representative. Representative Ketimer yields his time. Please continue. Thank you. There are facts colleagues that we know and then facts that we don't know. I find it today as I stand and ask this House to postpone this vote. I do so because our communities are frustrated that this bill is moving so fast. The bill to simply make permanent a program that just two months ago rules were final. It's March, and this bill's moving fast. In fact, in the Senate, two days, two days after the governor resigned, issued his letter, the Senate moved the bill. If it was drastic enough to have Governor Kitzhopper resign, should we not pause? And yet two days, the Senate ran the bill. And here we are, not two weeks after Governor Brown was sworn in to replace Governor Kitzhopper, we are here on this floor moving this bill. It may be at the end of the investigations that there is no additional evidence of improper influence or evidence of conspiracies to defraud Oregonians cloaked in the cause of reducing carbon output. There may be no criminal indictments, and I confess I hope so. I hope there are no indictments, and I hope our worst fear about what might have happened is not true. But in a mere few weeks after the extraordinary occurrence of the resignation of Governor Kitzhopper, we find ourselves here on the floor of the House of Representatives voting on that program, this program. The process, colleagues, must be protected to ensure the trust in our system of laws and how we enact them. And we have a duty to protect the process. And that process of trust for our constituents is more important than any one vote. And it's more important than any one bill. And I don't doubt that the advocates for this program have invested a lot of time into crafting a program that will achieve their goals. I fear goals that will come at the expense of Oregon families and the poor. 
And I understand that those goals often invoke a utopia that never was in order to achieve the spoils of political contests. But under this cloud, do we move forward? Madam Speaker, the majority party in this chamber has the power to choose not just the ends, but the means. The means, the process, when a bill's heard, and they chose when to hear this bill. When it came to committee and when it came to a floor. The power of one party rule in this state is vast. Now the voters chose that and I respect the voters. But I can never, never agree with the premise that the ends justifies the means. Madam Speaker, a cloud of corruption has engulfed our state government. And in that fog, can we see clearly who sneaks in the shadows? Can we see where we're going? Let the wind of transparency clear the air before we vote on this bill. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Representative. Further discussion on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Representative Reed. Thank you, Madam Speaker, to the motion. To the motion. Since the minority leader read his uh, letter to you, I wonder if you would uh, allow me to read your, your letter back to him. Uh, please proceed, uh, Mr. Pro Tem. Thank you. On February 23rd, you write, Dear Leader McLean, thank you for your letter of February 18th, 2015, regarding Senate Bill 324. As with every issue that comes before the legislature, I know House members will thoughtfully consider Senate Bill 324 on the merits of the policy addressed by the bill. I expect robust debate on the benefits and impacts of the Clean Fuels Program in committee and on the floor. A majority of Oregonians believe we must address climate change, and a majority of Oregon voters support the primary goal of the Clean Fuels Program, which is to reduce transportation-related air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions over the next 10 years. Other groups, such as the Oregon Business Association, support the program and believe it will help economic development opportunities for the state's renewable fuels industry. The implementing legislation for establishing a low carbon fuel standard in Oregon was passed in 2009. Since then, there has been a public process led by the Environmental Quality Commission to establish the rules of the program. Senate Bill 324 allows the program to proceed by repealing the sunset date. The bill also contains changes recommended by stakeholders on both sides of the issue to clarify elements of the program. The Senate had two public hearings in committee and four hours of floor debate on the bill. The House will certainly be as thorough. I believe the legislature can evaluate Senate Bill 324 on its merits. The House will continue the public and transparent consideration of the bill. And as always, I encourage Oregonians, wherever they stand on the issue, to let their representatives know what they think. Sincerely, Representative Tina Kotek, Speaker of the House. Madam Speaker, I would just make a couple of observations. I think we've lived up to your expectations about robust debate. As, as I look at the clock, we're now past about four and a half hours. And I think, Madam Speaker, it's time to vote. I urge a no vote on the motion to postpone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative. Colleagues, we've heard one reason to postpone it. Here's another. We've all heard about the transportation package. The transportation package would require a tax, a road tax. I was here in 2009, and we passed the JTA, and I voted for it. It was a heavy lift, going back to my district and talking about a six-cent road tax. Six cents. I survived politically because I had gone to each of my county commissioners and explained to them the need. At that time, there were 12. Today, there are 15. I had started those telephone calls earlier, two weeks ago, because it seemed to me that the need for our roads, our bridges, seismic work, all of the hundreds of millions of dollars of work that needs to be done to keep this state in business had reached a point where we needed to do something. Representative, I don't believe this is germane to the motion to postpone indefinitely. Can you keep to the motion at hand, please? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate that correction. The reason we need to postpone this indefinitely 
is because it needs to be set aside until we address these other issues. It needs to be set aside so we can address this other extraordinarily important issue called the transportation system. It needs to be delayed while we take care of these issues that absolutely go to the heart and foundation of doing business in this state. This bill, Excuse if me, Representative. Representative Reed, for what purpose are you in the privilege queue? Madam Speaker, I uh, would like to quote from Mason's legislative manual, page 82. Debate on a bill is confined to the bill under consideration and does not extend to criticism of other bills before the House or in committee. Thank you, Representative. Point is well taken, please, Madam Representative. Speaker, could, could you, uh, we're not I, talking I, about a transportation package. We're talking about a motion to postpone indefinitely. Representative Springer, for what purpose are you in the privilege queue? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Just a, a point of clarification, the transportation package was addressed, I can give specific times, within the conversation of committee. And looking at um, our rules here, it says um, a member may refer to discussion or actions that have taken place in committee meetings. There were at least three, four different opportunities or times that transportation was mentioned in that committee meeting. We are not discussing the main bill, though. We are discussing, uh, well, let me ask for a clarification. We're talking about the motion to postpone indefinitely. So let me check. We also come back to order. So not having access to the record of what did transpire in committee, I will assume that Representative Springer is speaking accurately that some discussion of a transportation package was discussed in committee. I will also point out that is not a bill but broadly speaking as an issue, if it was brought up in committee, the nature of this motion to postpone indefinitely does open us up back to the entire discussion of the full Senate Bill 324 and what did transpire in committee. So Representative Benz, please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for your patience. Colleagues, the challenge for me in going back to my district and, and obtaining support for uh, a tax is made that much greater by the bill that we're trying to postpone, I'm, or the motion to postpone applies to. This bill that we're trying to postpone would raise the cost of fuel. When it raises the cost of fuel, it makes it extraordinarily difficult to move on to yet another uh, cost increase later. So I'm just saying, if we can postpone it, it would give us that opportunity that I think all of us want to take advantage of of trying to have a conversation that is not already uh, negated, if we will, or had a negative outcome preordained by virtue of the passage of this bill. That's really an unfortunate event and could be resolved by referring that, uh, by voting for this motion. I urge and I vote. Representative Holvey, for what purpose are you in the privilege queue? Point of order, uh, Madam Speaker. I refer to section. Uh, 101 of Mason's manual, I do not believe this debate is uh, in order. We will take, uh, we'll stand the D's, take your inquiry uh, under advisement here. Hold on a moment. Could you repeat the? Uh... Uh, it's section 101, debate is limited to the question before the House. Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker. I, I have the floor right now. I would, I'd I'll read you that section if you like that Perfect. I'm referring to. It is out of order to refer in debate to a bill or other matters not yet reported by a committee. Neither is it in order to refer to proceedings of a committee unless the committee has formally reported its proceedings to the House. Members may not allude to nor relate in debate what was done or said in committee or by any member of the committee except such as is contained in the written report made to the House by the authority of the committee. Can we stand at ease a moment? Thank you, Representative. We are definitely enjoying our democracy today. <laughs> Representative Holvey, uh, um, we got some clarification and I want to thank my clerk for pointing out. I will read section 433 of Mason's motion to postpone indefinitely opens main question to debate. The motion to postpone indefinitely is debatable and opens the main question to debate. This is because any motion that proposes to make a final disposition of a question opens the merit of the question to debate. So on the matter of whether or not we can talk about transportation infrastructure and a transportation package and the need for one, 
that was debated in committee or at least raised by testimony. However, I do believe, and I will rule, it is inappropriate to imply that the passage or, not, or lack of passage of a particular bill will impact another. I think if you want to talk about the transportation package and the need for infrastructure, I would ask that you stick to that and not talk about the linkage between the two. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the clarification. Uh, colleagues, I think as evidenced by this debate and debate in committee, the need for transportation investment in Oregon is significant. The costs imposed by Senate Bill 324A on consumers will not go towards that investment. Timing matters, and I would ask for your I vote to postpone Senate Bill 324A indefinitely. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative. Representative Hoyle, for what purpose? You're not in the queue. Are you in the queue for a second? No, you are not. Further discussion on the motion to postpone indefinitely? Seeing none, Representative McLean, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, colleagues, for indulging our time here. The minority does not have the votes to pass a single bill, colleagues. All we have is our voice. All we have is our voice on this floor to present our case to you, to try to persuade you, to try to influence you, to say, slow down. But the majority party gets to decide today whether we do or whether we do not. We've talked on this motion to postpone that the reason to do this is because there are yet unanswered questions as to who was paid to influence who. We don't know yet because the evidence has not been disclosed. We recently saw with Cover Oregon when emails came out just recently, suspicions were confirmed that decisions were made for political expediency rather than policy. What will we know two months from now that we don't know today? If we pass this bill, we'll never know. Now, we may know and say, gosh, that would have made my decision different. But it will be too late. If you vote to postpone indefinitely today, you give Oregonians time to hear more about what criminal investigators are looking at. You give time for our Ethics Committee to make decisions. You give time for our Attorney General to come back into the investigation mode. It's been said that the timeline's been gone on a long time, but I stick with the handout that I showed you that it's recent. It's really been since 2012 that the program has been developed. It was under Governor Kula, uh, Kitzhopper's direction and authority. And who influenced him through Ms. Hayes? And what do they have to gain? Diane Rosenbaum and others have said, well, it's nonsense. Nonsense. There is no connection. There's no evidence whatsoever. And yet, methodically, I have shown you today, there is evidence. And of course, the most glaring is the resignation of our governor. Evidence which we can view in light of what we'll know after the investigations, what we'll know after these criminal subpoenas produce evidence for the grand jury. It's important to let the process take place. 
colleagues, it's important to let these investigations take place. The credibility of our executive branch will take decades to recover. I hope Governor Brown is listening because her words spoken in our house are going to be put to the test and she will have to choose whether to live by those words or ignore them. And colleagues, we have an ability to put this on hold. I urge you to do it. Oregonians want you to put this on hold, to postpone this. We are about to spend the money of Oregonians when they go to the gas pump. And not one dime for a road, not one dime for a bridge. And to what end? Representative, you're at time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative. We are now taking vote on the motion to postpone indefinitely. Those of the opinion that Senate Bill 324 should be postponed indefinitely will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Clerk will open the voting system. The motion to postpone indefinitely, having not received the required majority, is declared failed. <laughs> Colleagues, just to remind you, we are still under discussion on the main motion to approve Senate Bill 324A. He has not. Uh, further discussion, Representative McLean, Mike McLean. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the bill. I have a question for the carrier. Question of the carrier. Does the carrier yield? She does, it looks like. The All carrier right. does yield. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate your patience this day as you have fielded many questions. A representative from East Portland, do you feel that, is it your opinion that the committee that you chaired has in reviewing the permanent placement of these rules promulgated by DEQ for this low carbon fuels program received the best vetting that it could possibly receive in the House of Representatives? Thank you. We had a public process for this bill that every bill that this body considers goes through. We had two public hearings on this bill. At both public hearings, we had an opportunity to speak with DEQ as the agency who's managing this program. In addition, we had a work, work session where we talked about the merits of the bill. So yes, I feel like that this bill and our committee has had a thorough vetting and opportunity to go through this program. Make just one follow-up, Madam. Another question, does the carrier yield? I do. She does. Just to follow up to that question, um, representative from East Portland, was it the best vetting we could have given it in your opinion? As part of the democratic process that every single bill that we consider by this body goes through being the best process, then yes, it did have the best process. To the bill. To the bill. Colleagues, I'm going to uh, refer by reference what I previously talked about and not make any of you submit or sit through the next 30 minutes as we just discussed in the motion to postpone. Now, before you applause, remember decorum on the House floor.
But I would like to insert that here and say this is a, all those reasons are reasons to vote no. I'd like to point out a couple of aspects as to the policy of this bill and why I urge you to vote no. This bill puts into permanent application to our families in our communities this program enacted two months ago by the Department of Environmental Quality. A couple of responses. It was said by representative, multiple representatives that this is jobs. The DEQ did hire Jack Fawcett and Associates to do an economic study. And this report came out and said 29,000 jobs are going to be brought to Oregon. Of course, that was based upon an assumption that we would have eight to nine ethanol plants built in Oregon. Colleagues, today, as of today, there were two built. They both went bankrupt. One of them is now a storage for fuel. Second of all, the bill has been asserted as positive because it exempts agriculture and certain aspects from having to use the fuel that's been blended. The same applies today in our blending fuel law for ships or boating on the coast. And for those who want clear fuel, fuel that's not blended, it's available for you at a price of $1.74 more a gallon in Reed's Port, and I believe $1.50 more a gallon in Seaside. When you, by government edict, shrink the ability for people to legally supply a market, you do nothing but raise the price. It's simple logic. I don't believe that exemption will serve our agriculture industry or our construction industry well at all. California was brought up. California, that beacon of pure, effective, logical thought that emanates over legislatures within a certain amount of proximity. We are not California North, of course, colleagues. We are Oregon. But let's say for a moment we were California, as perhaps those who advocate for a West Block and to have a one big market might be. California, this is the information that was given to me, has only achieved 1% of its target and has now got its program on hold. Now, of course, after 10 years, they don't even hit the target we start at. My concern, colleagues, is that the policy is flawed and does nothing more than pander to some ideologue notion that is not achievable at the cost of our families and the poor in Oregon. Now, there has been suggested other ways to do it because we do want our children to breathe air that doesn't cause asthma. Absolutely, there's no disagreement on that. And I suppose, colleagues, today, we have to ask ourselves, does this bill are we convinced that this bill will achieve that end? And if so, are we prepared to acknowledge the cost we paid to achieve the ideology we ascribe? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Vega Peterson, for the close. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, we have had a long and, as the Speaker pred predicted, robust debate today on Senate Bill 324A. I appreciate the participation, I appreciate the passion that everyone has shown, and 
The love that we have for the state of Oregon, the concern we have for the people in this state is palpable. I wanted to address a few things that were brought up today. Um, one of those that was brought up was um, the process that DEQ will use in order to put a price ceiling on the, uh, the credits. I wanted to clarify that um, the price ceiling in the credits is part, will be part of the rulemaking process, um, as well as the other cost containment tools that we've asked them to provide. This credit process will allow Oregon businesses to invest in the new and emerging technologies that lead to the development of the cleaner fuels. I also wanted to clarify for the representative from Grants Pass that demonstrated means um, in the bill that he asked, means requiring documentation to ensure the exemptions aren't abused. So they're re requiring documentation. I just want to make sure you had that in case it changed your vote. So. There was also a question about the indirect land use, um, the ILUC or, or land use that a lot of people were talking about today. This is something that DEQ will consider when making the final rules for this. In an FAQ that they provided, um, they, they had stated in committee that the science is changing on this very rapidly and they wanted to be sure that they were using the most recent si science um, but they had stated in their FAQ, California has recently proposed updated ILUC values and adoptions by the California Air Resources Board. These will provide certainty needed for future discussions about including ILUC in Oregon's program. Colleagues, when I had my very first car, it was a 1989 Mercury Tracer. I called it the Blueberry. And on this car, I had a window decal that I was able to put on it that said, love your mother. It was a picture of our globe, and it said, love your mother. I liked it for two reasons. One, I did love my mother. And two, I loved our planet, and I wanted to be sure that we took care of the planet, even at that young age. We know global warming is a serious threat. It threatens the livelihood and the way of life for Oregonians in the upcoming decades. We know that greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels leads to global warming. And we know that 36% of all of Oregon's greenhouse gas emissions comes from transportation. There was a quote in this morning's Mail Tribune that summed up the need for us to pass this bill very well. That the world's climate is changing as a result of human activity is no longer subject to serious debate. The only question remaining is what we intend to do about it. We can throw up our hands and dismiss incremental steps such as the Clean Fuels Program, or we can recognize that enough small steps add up to big strides and join the effort instead. Today is our day to join this effort. Our yes vote on this bill will allow us to do that. And it is time to vote yes on this bill. Thank you. The doorkeepers will bar the doors, the sergeant at arms will attend, and the clerk will open the voting system to determine the presence of a quorum. Those of the opinion that Senate Bill 324A should be. <laughs> Those of the opinion the bill should pass will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Clerk will open the voting system. Representative Smith. So apologize. I need to change my aye to no. Uh, Representative Smith votes no. Representative Clem, how do you vote? Clem votes aye. Representative Springer, how do you vote? Springer votes no. Senate Bill 324A, having received a constitutional majority, is declared passed.